I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome to another Real Conversation, this one with Mark Gordon, who's the founder of the Oil Ascent Fund. As those of you that know, Quad 3, that's where we've gone bullish from bearish on oil. So for me, you know, trying to find somebody who's actually bullish, first of all, and somebody who's quite bullish, second of all, was hard to find. But, uh, but Mark, in particular, has one of the better presentations you're going to find on, on being very bullish or overtly bull bullish or Trumpian, however you want to describe being, uh, with all the adjectives inclined, being as bullish as possibly could be. Mark, definitely, you're, you're the guy on this. So thanks for making the time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah, being here. Appreciate you um, going through all the work that you did. And and usually, you know, we just the real conversation is just a back and forth of questions. But I thought your content was so good. Like this slide deck is is to me, it's certainly not gold. It's it's oil. I mean, but it is deep and it's broad. Uh, there are five real components to this, and I wanted to just dive in bit by bit and let you walk through Great. You know, the fundamental bull case. And um, so we'll, we'll take the time to do that. Uh, but first, let's just go through like the cyclicality of oil and how you think about it. All right. Well, so as you know, uh, oil oscillates back and forth between scarcity and abundance, and uh, it's sort of reflexive in the, in the uh, Soros sense meaning that a low oil price brings a high oil price, and a high oil price brings a low oil price. And so uh, Soros's concept of reflexivity is that the price does not reflect reality, it changes reality. And with oil, that's most definitely the case. And so I think over the last 15 years, we've gone through two different pricing regimes in oil, and we're about to enter a third. So if you go back to 2003, we were, from 2003 to about 2014, we were in the peak oil pricing regime for oil. And then we went to a period of abundance. And now I think we're about to return to scarcity. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the regime is really what drives the price. So if you page forward to page um, four on here, I think this is kind of an interesting slide because you can see that oil was both $10.35 and $100.47 when the days of forward demand were exactly the same. So what that tells you is that it's not inventory that's driving the price so much as it is the regime in which uh, you are. And so today on page five, you can see that we have more or less normal inventories, mm -hmm. but the oil price is arguably low now. If you were to do a simple correlation off of this, um, looking back in the last five, six years, the oil price is probably $10 where it would normally be given the current uh, inventory. It could be $10 above where it should be. So we're at the low end of the spectrum. But the, the point I want to make here is that it's not the inventory level that drives the price. It's the regime in which we're at. And, um, and that's the thing that a lot of people miss. I mean, uh, first of all, they wouldn't take, and, and I should have mentioned, I mean, you used to be at Soros, so it's not just random that you're using Soros reflexivity. That's correct. But a lot, a lot of people, I mean, that are market-based uh, don't just use supply and demand when they think about the price of anything. And in this case, uh, in oil, you're using multiple regimes, multiple different periods of history. That's right. Um, and, and, and the key uh, point, if you go back to the first page of the presentation, is I think we're about to move from what is the age of abundance to a return of scarcity. Right. So I think the pricing regime for oil is about to change. That's great. And, and I, I think that when that happens, um, it's going to be a very important moment for oil stocks. Um, and, and, but, but I think to really understand this, it's good to understand the history behind the different regimes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's worthwhile to back up to 2003 mm -hmm. and think about how back then we entered what was then considered to be the peak oil regime. Mm -hmm. And if we were having this discussion then, then everybody would think it would make perfect sense. Correct. I, I remember when I was at a hedge fund, which renamed the fund Dawson Sandberg to jo Dawson Giamalva. Uh, plenty of people know who these, these, these guys are. It was based primarily that being an oil investor back then was quite profitable, particularly uh, on the long short side. Well, so, so from 2003 all the way to 2008, I mean, the energy stocks did amazingly well. <laughs> and, and, and people were sort of surprised the whole way as the oil price edged up. Right. And if you think back then, I mean, 2003, there was this Princeton professor, Kenneth DeFaze, he published a book on peak oil theory, and he said we were about to hit it right there and then. 
And back then I was working for Goldman Sachs. I actually brought him into the office to explain this to you know, the chief investment officer. But, <laughs> but back then, from 2003 all the way to 2008, he came out with a book. You, you probably remember Matt Simmons came out with a book. It was called Twilight in the Desert, all about Saudi Arabian oil. That was a little frightening. Um, the German military put out a piece talking about how you know, we're going to run out of, or not run out of oil, but at least have oil production yeah. stop, stop growing. So you, you couldn't go six months without some major you know, assessment of that ha happening. So it's worth backing up and thinking, why did everyone think like this and were they crazy back then? Yep. And so to, to do that on page eight, I just sort of talk about what the peak oil theory is. Mm -hmm. And there was this geologist, his name was King Hubbard, and King was really actually his first name, it's kind of remarkable. And in 1956, he said US oil production would peak in 1970. So it was a 14-year forecast, and he got that right. And, and he was talking about conventional production. So mm -hmm. of course, we all know we've had shale now bring us to a new peak. But he was talking specifically about conventional production. And I would submit to you that that's probably the single best long-term forecast that anyone has ever gotten right. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we both work on Wall Street. And we know how difficult it is to get any forecast right. And here's a guy that managed to look 14 years out into the future and get it right. So how did he do it? On page nine, it basically shows his methodology. It shows discoveries in the lower 48 mm -hmm. that followed a bell curve. And he basically just applied a lag factor to it and said, you know what? Discoveries have a bell curve. A bell curve you know, peaks at 50%. And I'm going to do the same thing to production. You know, there, 1970, hey, I was right. No one thought he was going to get that right. And he did. <laughs> and people were speechless. So then what happened? What happened on the next page, page 10, is everyone tried to apply this to the world. And so here's a chart from James Schlesinger, which he presented to the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. So this is a pretty serious chart. I mean, it was you know, used to inform US government opinion. And it looks very similar to the one on the previous page, which was just the United States. right? Uh -huh. And so if you stick with that, oil production is going to roll over 50% depletion. You turn to page 11. And you can see why everyone was concerned. Mm -hmm. you, you see, they, they thought that the EUR, which is the estimated ultimate recovery of oil, was 2.5 trillion barrels. And so they were saying, it's going to roll over in 2010. Mm -hmm. And so from 2003, people were looking forward to 2010. And this whole price marched up. And we had more and more conversions to this point of view. And then we got to 2010, what happened? It didn't roll over. <laughs> it didn't roll it didn't, over. Didn't roll over. <laughs> and but, demanded. <laughs> well, the methodology didn't work. So what did they do? They said, well, you know, maybe my 2.5 trillion is not right. I'm going to say it's 2.6 trillion. So you push it out a little bit. You get to 2012. Right. It's a classic. Uh, well, only on the sell side or in Washington would you come up with that 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 push. Yeah. So so <laughs> you're right. And then you get to 2014, and then everyone's like, this is. Nonsense. This this theory absolutely <laughs> makes zero sense, and you know the peak oil people are crazy. The websites shut down. They all go quiet because they don't have a way to explain why it didn't happen. I mean, they're they're confused. Mm -hmm. So their theory had a fundamental flaw, and I explain that on page tw twelve. That's great. The, the basically the flaw was in the seventies when the oil price went up a nominal dollars fourteen x. It basically killed demand. And because it killed demand, production never ramped as high as it could. Mm. So we were below what would have been the theoretical maximum. And when I say theoretical maximum, I mean, it's a little bit more than theoretical because we can see examples of it working. And w w what I mean by that is compare the six-day war oil embargo, which is circled on this chart, and the Yom Kippur war em em uh, embargo. In both cases, the West um, was embargoed. Mm -hmm. In the first case, the oil price had absolutely no, no, there was no impact to it. And in the second case, it went up 4x. Mm. And, and the reason it went up 4x is because we were at a point of no spare capacity. Right. So that's why we started and we came below the Hubbard curve here. And basically, it felt like there was a glut of oil, which there was because supply was much greater than demand, or demand was much lower than what the theoretical maximum of supply could be. Mm. So, so what's that do? On the next page, you can see that it defers peak oil. I mean, that's just you know, common sense. And also tells you that you don't peak at the 50% uh, 
part of the bell curve. So all the peak oil guys were using that math, they were just thinking about this the wrong way. On, on the next page, page 14, you can see how you can modify this theory to account for the fact that we never ramped as high as uh, we could have. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, the blue area and the pink area are equal. So you, you basically, you come back onto that limitation where you get to no spare capacity and you know, production's just falling, but you, you defer it. So if you use this kind of adjusted theory, you get what you have on page 15. Sticking with the same ultimate estimate estimated ultimate recovery of 2.5 or 2.6 trillion barrels, you can see now, because we never ramped as high, mm. you get you know, sometime between 2020 and 2024 is when you really have a problem. And so this is unbounded. There's no exact point I can pick here, but I think the general methodology is important because people forget that oil is finite. And you know, I've heard some people tell me, well, it's not finite. You know, we regenerate oil, sure, in millions of years. So it's you know, for all intents and purposes, it's it's finite. And and this is something to consider. And the oil, the major oil fields in the world that are producing are all very, very old, right? So, what's my final conclusion on Hubbard? It's on the next page. He got lucky. <laughs> the reason he got lucky is because his forecast was not affected by price, and the the big move in price happened later which then basically made it more difficult to apply his theory to the world. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, the geology is important. It does limit um, oil, but you got to also think about what price does. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all, and the volatility of price, which you're going to get into, but I, I think so many people miss that point. And, and, and you can go all the way back to Einstein where, they, where he would say, okay, look, there's a finite assumption and there's an unbounded assumption. And if you, if you change volatility and you start to you know, change volatility of anything, you're going to start to change the behavior of things. That's right. And, and, that's, and that's what happened. Ultimately, he was, he was if, if I'm hearing you right, and this makes perfect sense, you know, in a low volatility environment, your Gaussian assumptions on a bell curve on production versus discovery end up being, oh, voila. But if you add volatility to that, you change the price, you change everyone's behavior, the, that's gonna. That, it's, that's it's, what ultimately happened. It sort of goes back to the Soros reflexivity, where the price changed the outcome in in the world. Yes, but but that doesn't change the fact that there's a finite um, amount of capacity. It doesn't change the fact there's a finite amount of capacity, and it doesn't change the fact that when you go back to the, the slide, which shows when this might impact us, we we basically deferred it, mm -hmm. um, and we've deferred it by a decade. But if you think about it, we're producing oil at all-time highs now. So the, the compounding effect of what you, you use um, is, is immense. Mm -hmm. So what's different today versus 2010 when they thought we had peak oil? Well, what's different is we've produced you know, 360 billion barrels of oil. I mean, so, so back then, everyone- The age of abundance, as you call it. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> well, back then everyone was talking about it, and it's actually more relevant now, and no one is talking about it now because no one wants to look like a fool. Right. Because we went from the peak oil concern into the age of abundance, and what, I, what drove that was the high price. The high price changed the world. Mm -hmm. And so the two things that basically bring us to the age of abundance are tight oil or shale oil. Um, tight oil is actually better nomenclature and peak demand. It's mm -hmm. sort of, we went from peak you know, supply to peak demand and the peak demand today is driven by the concerns around CO2 uh, and a need for um, uh, a, a move to a new energy regime, basically energy transition. Mm -hmm. So if you turn to the next page, you know, I just talk about this age of abundance. So on slide 18, uh, on slide 18, here, here are the, uh, the the main considerations. Yeah, age of abundance is fear of peak demand, mm -hmm. which is one of the big reasons people hate the energy space now. And then new supply, and the main part of new supply is tight oil. But we also had oil sands in Canada, and then we had this subsalt in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And so we, the high oil prices, made us find new new discoveries. And then the final point here is OPEC in the age of abundance, ramped production. Yes, exactly. And so the reason they ramped production, or at least one of the reasons they ramped production, was ties to the, 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 the fear of peak demand. They did not want to have stranded assets, so they brought up their production. Mm -hmm. So on the next page, just think about peak demand. Now this is what everyone is concerned about. This is why 
the, the oil stocks have low multiples. But the irony is, is that in the period before, the period of you know, what I call the peak oil period, um, the peak demand argument was almost more compelling because the market was looking for many ways around this because they saw the supply crisis coming. So we had LNG for trucks, trains, and ships back then. We had compressed natural gas, coal to liquids, biofuels, and also electric vehicles. Now all we have is electric vehicles, and the electric vehicles are not being driven by the market, they're being driven by government, mm -hmm. which is very different, and we'll, we'll come to that. That's, a, in my opinion, it's a problem, because I think we do need an energy transition, but I think the energy transition needs to be driven by the market and not by government. Mm -hmm. I think if it's driven by government, it's not going to be effective. And um, so, that, so I, I'm for describing where we're going. Now, so, tight, tight oil is not what everyone calls it, right? I mean, I guess it is the proper nomenclature, though, right? Well, so the reason, the reason I think tight oil is better than shale oil yeah. is, is because shale is the source rock. And uh, in the case of natural gas, you're actually producing from the source rock. rock. So shale gas make, makes sense. The gas molecule is one-tenth the size of the oil molecule. So what's happened with the oil molecule is it's migrated from the source rock, for the most part, and it's gone into really tight reservoirs. So if you think about oil, we basically went away from the easy oil, and that was a big part of the peak oil concern. Yep. And, and tight oil is also not easy oil. It's oil that has very low permeability. Mm. So you have to drill down a mile, across two miles, and frack. Mm. And um, the thing is, is that we became so efficient at producing this bad oil that the cost came down. But when you think about it on the spectrum, we're moving towards less easy oil. We're going offshore, we're doing the oil sands, we're going to the Arctic, and then we're doing tight oil. And tight oil is just one of those multiple facets or f multiple options that the, where the cost managed to come down. And just for people who don't understand how it works, imagine 30 fire trucks around the top of a well all injecting water and sand at the same time. A hundred train car loads of sand per well. And so that go all goes in under massive pressure, cracks open the rock, and then the sand keeps it open and enables the wells to flow. This is truly American ingenuity, and this is something which has had massive, a massive impact on the economy. I mean, I think it's part of the reason that American growth since the great financial crisis has been better than, you know, growth elsewhere in the world. And it's also changed America's situation from a foreign policy perspective. Right. We're now, you know, almost a net importer of oil. I mean, that's a dramatic improvement. And also, it's interesting, but a higher oil price does not hurt the American economy the way it used to. Mm -hmm. So I understand the president's concern about wanting to keep the oil price down because that you know, could potentially be a drag on consumers. But because we produce so much more oil now, if the oil price actually went up, it would be a positive for US manufacturing, for the US oil industry. Mm. So there's been a large change. Mm -hmm. But we're going to talk about tight oil because I think that we have the, the, the large growth numbers that we're going to see from that is, is over. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the inflection point that's bringing us to the next uh, period, the next regime, a return to scarcity. And that, that in and of itself is a highly contrarian statement. I mean, we have we published on the uh, Hedge Eye website uh, some of the work from the guys at Sailing Stone, which is a, a longer term natural resource investing buy side firm in uh, San Francisco. Um, but again, they are considered contrarian for having this view that you've effectively high graded uh, that rock. Well, so I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. I guess what I would say is that the opinion that we've seen peak growth from tight oil in the last three months is probably very close to consensus. Now the, it is? Now it is, yeah. yeah. The forecasting bodies, meaning the IEA, EIA, and OPEC, are not quite there yet. Right. But you know, Goldman Sachs thinks that's the case. Mark Papa, who was one of the founders of EOG, he thinks that's yep. the case. I mean, m many um, people have changed their mind, and it all happened really, really recently. So we're kind of at the inflection point right <laughs> yeah, now. See how this happens? More people join it as the oil price goes up. That's an amazing uh, uh, reality well, as well. Well, <laughs> the, the, but, but I mean, the oil price is going up because people are getting to this conclusion. It's sort yeah, of, yeah. It, 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 works, it works both it's ways, right? So just quickly. On that, by the way, I think you said this to me. I mean, can you imagine if Goldman Sachs came out with this view in 04? 
I mean, they wouldn't have been able to in 04, but they were, you know, nobody cared when they came up with this view this time. Well, well, so in 2004, Arjun Murdy, who's a great analyst, he came out and he had that super spike call. Yeah, I and remember. That, that was one of those calls that, you know, when I say we had the Princeton professor, we had Matt Simmons, we had Arjun Murdy making the call, we had the German military. <laughs> I mean, we had many people saying we're going to have a problem, and they were saying we're going to have a problem in three, four years. And I mean, Arjun's call wasn't necessarily a geology call it was a capex cycle call but it was still, which we're, we're having right now by the way you make that same thing yeah, uh, call yeah, right now? yeah yeah but so we're going to get to it but the, the interesting thing is you know Goldman has recently come out with the similar call today but they're not saying it's way off in the future they're saying it's in 15 months they're mm -hmm. saying 2021 non OPEC production doesn't grow and for me it's shocking that someone like them can make that call and I think their call is correct um, and it's so close to where we are right now. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So um, I mentioned oil sands was another one of the things mm -hmm. that, that, that added su supply. I'll just point out that that's now bottlenecked. I mean, you and I are both Canadian. You know, uh, we're, we're you know, I mean, I'm a proud Canadian. Mm -hmm. But, but, but the, the, the sad thing about Canada is uh, they cannot grow their production right now because the environmentalists have um, uh, basically are not allowing them to build a pipeline. The, the, the other uh, area where there was um, large discoveries was in Brazil, subsalt. And so subsalt is basically, you couldn't image it with, with uh, seismic. So it was kind of a new oil province that they found. Yeah. And, and there's clearly a lot of oil there, but we had a bid round there a, a few weeks ago, and the majors didn't participate. And they're not participating because they're, they're in the age of abundance uh, uh, framework and they're saying we're going to have peak demand in the future so we're not going to spend on this. And then, you know, here also is, you know, the last page in the section is OPEC ramping production. I mean, they, when, when you have um, fears of peak demand, uh, you do not want to have a stranded asset. Mm -hmm. So that was one of, the, one of the reasons they did this. Now, of course, they've cut back recently. Even if you just took that, you know, that chart on slide 23 and overlaid it with the lows of the sector, I mean, it's just classically how somebody could, could believe that that is the future forever. Because you got peak production from OPEC, you have the low price in both the, the commodity and in the equities. Well, the equities are even lower now. We're going to yeah. get, I have a slide in that, but, 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 but that um, was, that, I mean, you couldn't, you, I mean, oil, uh, ener energy earnings were down, I think, a hundred and uh, something percent in the first quarter of 2016. I mean, that's when people completely capitulated. The first time. I mean, we've had a capitulation here the second time, I understand yeah, that. Yeah. But I mean, before they had a big rally in 2017. I mean, most, most people who were along energy and in, you know, coming out of that and into 17 had a pretty good year. Uh, after that, not so much. Well, so actually, I, I, I yeah. Um, we're, we're at new lows now, but I think we'll it's, uh, well, I think we're about to, that's about to change. So, so now I think we're we're going to go from the age of abundance, which was primarily driven by shale and peak demand, and I think we're about to return to scarcity, and I think that's going to be the new regime. That and, that that is the most contrarian thing. I mean, this this only gets better. So like, continue, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I start this off with a quote from the director of the IAEA. Um, but he basically says that, you know, he said this in 2017, but in, in three to four years' time, we may see a significant supply-demand gap with major consequences. This will not be filled by shale oil. I mean, he was warning us back then because, you know, what we were seeing back then is what you see in the next page, which is we've had the largest cutback cuts in history this time around. Mm. I mean, bigger than what you got back in 1986. And so aside from the shale, you know, when you look at conventional projects, they take five to seven years to, to ramp up. So we had $100 oil from, you know, 2010 to 2014. We had new projects come on for that. For, for that. And if you turn to the next page, this is the Goldman slide, um, you can see that we had, because of the $100 oil in 2010 to 2014, we had a lot of new projects. But then the, the projects coming to market, they stepped down. Mm. And they stepped down because the oil price fell and we had the CapEx cuts. And so if you want to turn this back on, the, 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 the time to get the, uh, a new project is five to seven years. So you can't turn this on quickly. That's if the project even, you know, potential project exists. So a bear would quit, the, one of the core tenets of the bear case is that production gets turned back on. You will never believe how fast it comes back online. Well, so that 
will refer to tight oil, and we're yep. uh, we're about to get there. Yep. Um, but 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 the bear would even have to acknowledge that tight oil needs to offset, starting in 2021, right. the capex cuts from this. Mm -hmm. Which kind of brings you back to Hubbard's original projection, right? If your future production growth and the path of future production growth looks like that, then you're gonna, you're gonna have to show me new discoveries, you're gonna have to show me something I don't see. Right, we haven't had new discoveries uh, for a decade yep. um, of any, well, we had Guiana, but I mean, like it's great for Hess, but it's not great from a macro perspective. Yep. Um, so just one, one more slide on conventional production. This, yeah, just this one's a good one on slide 28, decline rates. Yeah, yeah. well, so, you know, I'm, sh this is a Wood McKenzie slide. You can find it on their website, but uh, um, uh, it just shows that with a, a delay, decline rates will likely increase. So that's, you know, this could have a, quite a large impact because the declines are so large in general. And is this, a, this is the point, like you said, in the last three months, you know, the people that have the sharpest minds and do, you know, do time things better than the crowd are starting to agree to agree on, on some of these. Well, so, so we're going to talk about timing and timing is really hard. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've certainly gotten it wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I never thought that, that people could be so negative now. And I think a lot of that has to do with the trade deal situation. Yep. Um, but um, it's pretty clear that when you get to the second half of next year, this is going to be a fo focus. Mm -hmm. So this question is, how do you get to the second half of next year? I mean, it's kind of, you know. This being decline rates. The, the, the decline rates, the conventional production no longer growing, tight oil needing to offset that. Yep. Right? So on the tight oil side, just imagine if tight oil is going to slow down and this is going to kick in, then you have a real problem, right? right. And so it, it, that's effectively Goldman's call. They, they said that you know, a few, maybe about a month ago now, they said non-OPEC production is not going to grow starting 2021. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about that, like it's just, that's a, for an oil guy, that's a huge call. And I think they're correct. I was excited they said it because it sort of gives me legitimacy in, in my, you know, argument. And, you know, I kind of have to borrow on them because, from them, because I'm, you know, just, you know, one guy with an opinion and, you know, they're Goldman Sachs. But it's not the sell side's opinion. It's actually one, they're the first sell side firm to move on it. Well, so they've said something like that. I think Energy Aspects sees something like that. I think Bernstein sees something like this. I think actually that the issue is that people are too short term focused. I think if you went back to even 2016, people saw this coming. Yeah. And, and what actually happened is that shale surprised the upside. So everyone was like, ah, oh, it doesn't even matter that this is coming, mm -hmm. right? But, but, but we're now in a different spot with shale. Mm -hmm. So he, he, let's talk about shale for a little bit, right? So, or, or tight oil, I mean, uh, so, so, so now this describes the basins in America. And you can see that we're basically, you know, left with the Permian that is the growth vehicle. Mm -hmm. And the Permian is the only one uh, that is growing a lot now. Before the Eagleford and the Bakken were also growing a lot. And also the Gulf of Mexico is part of the conventional oil surge. So the Gulf of Mexico every year for the last five years is at 125,000 barrels a day. And next year is the last year that it grows and it grows in the first half of next year and then you know it starts to time. decline. So it goes from a, uh, a tailwind to a headwind. You know, the Eagleford and the Bakken, you know, they were tailwinds, they're going to be headwinds. They're, we're going we're to be just relying on the, the uh, Permian. So you only have one basin growing. And then the three other points to, to think about is well productivity has peaked. We're going to talk about that. Industry is now focused on free cash flow. That's a huge change. And actually, the resource size has shrunk in the mm -hmm. last couple of years. So on the next page. Before you go there, the, yeah. on slide 20, like if you have, like I have spoken to people that are, are more concerned about decline. If the more concerned you are about decline rates uh, and the more fundamentally oriented your view is on that, the more bullish you'd be relative to your view because you're just you're just well, saying, hey, well, here's the status that well, they've already told us. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so one way you can get even more bullish than, uh, than I am, and there are definitely people who hold this and people who I um, respect and have been doing this longer than me, but another argument for why productivity or why production is about to, to decline in America mm -hmm. is, is because um, we have used up a lot of the tier one locations. Exactly. 
So you can add that to this. That's what I mean by high grading. That yeah. would be the sailing stone. Yeah, 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 right. So, so that that adds to all this. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, so there, there are multiple arguments now why why we're going to see lower growth from uh, America. Mm -hmm. And and you know, there's multiple. I mean, this is you don't have to listen to Mark Gordon. You can listen to Mark Papa. I mean, Mark Papa is founder of EOG. He's now the executive chairman of Schlumberger. I mean, he just said on the Centennial earnings a few weeks ago that U.S. production is going to grow. 400, I think it was 450 or 400,000 barrels a day going forward. I mean, that, that is, we're, we're, I'll show you the forecast, but that's so much lower than all the, the forecasts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like everybody who does oil, it's easy to get it wrong. And he, he like me, has gotten it wrong in the past, but let, you, you cannot ignore someone of that um, ilk right. saying this, right? Mm -hmm. So here's well productivity. And you can see that we've had you know, year after year after year of massive improvements, yeah. right? And so what drove this? I mean, maybe high grading drove some of it. Longer laterals dro drove some of it. Putting more sand in the wells, mm -hmm. fracking with more fluid and cracking the wells to drill, drill, drill this. But if you just think logically about this, right? If you're growing at 30% per well <laughs> and you don't add a rig, production grows at 30%. But if you're growing at 30% per well, I mean, and that goes to zero, and you want to grow production, you have to massively increase your rig count. Mm -hmm. So it's a much more difficult situation. And, you know, there's people that are going to argue that this zero percent is going to go negative. That, that argument would be the sailing stone argument, yeah. which you just said, which is we're going to have uh, moved to tier two um, locations. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's part of the situation. On the next page, this speaks to the free cash flow focus of the industry now. I never thought I'd, hear, I'd see a slide that says this. Yeah, well, but it, it, it's, it's amazing. The stocks have been punished so much, and this is another example of Soros' reflexivity. They go down, what do you do? You buy back your shares. Yeah. I mean, you generate free cash flow. And, and I think that the U.S. oil industry really gets um, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a bad, they have a bad reputation. Mm -hmm. Their reputation is they just waste money. Okay? Yeah, that's part of that's earned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> part, part of it's earned, but if you go back to when they started doing this, the, the thought was the oil price was going to go up a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And so we were in the $100 oil regime, and if we hadn't had these guys, we would have gone to the $200 Fair oil. Fair enough. Oil. Like their, their drill baby drill, their behavior was based on their expectation of the future higher prices. It, it, was, it was based upon the expectation of future prices, but it was required. Yeah. And they effectively saved the world for, you know, from, from economic disaster for, the, for this decade. So they should be lauded for that. And they didn't think the oil price was going to fall like this. I mean, to give you an example, Canadian companies still to this day, when they um, do their reserve analysis published by their reserve auditors, they use an upward sloping price deck. So it starts at spot price, goes up 2.5% every year. <laughs> and that's left over from the $100 oil regime, yeah. right? Because that's what everyone thought right back then. Mm -hmm. And so the shale industry definitely, you know, were irresponsible. But when you put them in the context of the situation, the peak oil context, they were doing something that was helpful. Mm -hmm. And now they're doing the opposite, actually. Now they're focused on free cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would say is, you know, a lot of people question this business model. And the business model, you know, it doesn't work with a low oil price. It depends upon the oil price, right? And so the remarkable thing about these guys is they, you know, in, in 2014, no one would have thought that you could have a break even around 50. They, they took their break even down a lot. And so if the oil price actually ever goes back up to you know, a higher level, they will mint free cash flow mm. because they took their cost structure down. And so that, that is what they did that's amazing. But you some, know, of them are our, some of the Canadians are already minting free cash flow. Well, that's actually yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's true. And, and there's some of the Americans, too. I mean, like, you know, let's not throw them all under the bus. Yeah. But, 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 the, but the, whether the business model works or doesn't work, is partly dependent upon the oil price. Of course. Of course. Yeah, right. And so, um, so you now have an industry focused on free cash flow. But the argument could be, well, they're focused on free cash flow now, but you know, the oil price goes up, they're not going to be focused on free cash flow uh, again. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And let me sh explain why I think that's wrong in the next page. Slide 32? Slide 32. I just cut out you know, part of Parsley's presentation. Parsley is a you know, tier one Permian producer. And if you look at this, you can see that they've from 2017 to 2019, they've cut their spacing of wells in half. 
Wow. Right? So effectively, they've downgraded their resource by almost a half. I mean, mm -hmm. they would say, well, you know, our wells got better, so you know, it's not quite a half. Maybe it's downgraded by 40%. But this is something that almost every Permian player has done. Yep. It used to be that we thought there was unbounded growth in the Permian, and now it's clearly bounded. So if you think that you can only double one more time production in the Permian, which I think is about correct. Forever. Forever, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> are, are you going to grow at 25%? I mean, to me, that makes zero sense because you will hit peak production in three years. Mm -hmm. so, so there's no reason to grow like they did before. Before, it was unlimited. We didn't know how, how much oil is here we're going to grow. And also before, the oil price was higher. So what they were going to do is they're going to drill wells closer. Mm. And, and now the oil price came down. We're going to drill them further apart. And we are going to be more disciplined. And if I think I can only double, I mean, why grow more than 12%? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And the other basins, the Eagleford and the Bakken, I mean, why grow at all? I mean, <laughs> Whiting is considering not growing again. So, so this is why I think that if the oil price goes up, they'll remain more disciplined than what we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, this age of abundance had two sides to it. It had the tight oil, which we just went through while that's slowing down, but it also had peak demand, right? And so that narrative is all about us shifting to EVs. I've never heard about that one. Yeah, right. No, that's, that's, that's the you know, scary yeah. narrative for oil, right? Yeah. So let me just throw an idea at you. Look at what SUVs have done over the last eight years. They've gone from 17% of sales to 38. This totally wipes out any impact from EVs. <laughs> this looks like every parking lot in Fairfield County where you take your kids. That makes sense. Yeah, every, yeah. every single, every, including the Uber that might be picking you up, if it's your own or it's theirs, that looks exactly like that chart. It's I'm, an amazing thing relative to the you know, to the, to the narrative, you know, the ESG narrative, whatever the narrative is, that you know, people are choosing to effectively put the most, you know, buy the thing that, that requires the most gasoline. Well, so, so <laughs> if, if you think about it, right, th this is the opposite to we're improving efficiency uh, story. And, you know, if you think about efficiency improvements in, in vehicles, I mean, it's all about cafe standards, right? And so the corporate average fuel economy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so people have an issue with the government no longer trying to mandate um, improvements in cafe standards. And on the face of it, that makes a lot of sense, right? You know, who doesn't want cars to be more efficient? But if you make a car more efficient, you make it lighter. And if you make it lighter, what happens is there's more deaths and maimings when you have an accident. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that really should be the individual's choice. And that might be part of the reason why you buy an SUV. I mean, mm -hmm. are you going to put your wife and your kids in you know, some small car? I mean, not if you can afford to. Uh, avoid that. No, I think it's 100% true. I have four kids, and that's, a, you know, from a behavioral perspective, is exactly what's going on. Right. On so, top of the fact that you can't fit your four kids and all their, their stuff in, in anything else. Well, so the other problem, <laughs> right, is that if you want to have this energy transition, you know, uh, you're not going to do it with a low oil price. You mm. need a high oil price to, to make the energy transition happen. So, you know, the bottom bullet right here is peak demand will not happen with low prices. Low prices are enabling those SUV transition. Yep. Now, on the next page, let's talk about EVs. I think it's remarkable that EVs sales right now are down year over year. I mean, I don't think very many people realize that. And um, it really started in the third quarter. And it started because China, which is more than 50% of EV sales, cut their subsidies in half. So in August, Chinese sales were down 16%. September, they're down 34%. October, 46%. Now we're talking about a really large number, right? And American EV sales are down also. I mean, American EV sales are, are uh, that's year over year. They're really, it's really just Tesla. And, you know, Tesla, or EV sales in America are 52 per, sorry, 48 percent sold to California. I, I wonder what impact the um, multiple blackouts they're having over there is going to have on EV sales. I think people don't think about That's that. That's interesting. Uh, the, uh, but, but again, would it change your behavior when you have limited range and you have to charge it? You know, in that case, of course it would. You, you, yeah. you, would, you would think so. Mm -hmm. but, but the point to this, right, is that EV sales 
you know, have been driven by subsidies. Mm -hmm. And you get rid of them, and it's not the market that's doing this, it's, it's the government that's doing this. You get rid of them, you sort of see what happens. And so the funny thing is, Tesla, if you go back and you read you know, Elon Musk's biography, I mean, he was actually working with Peter Thiel. And uh, the, the, he, he focused on an EV because he was worried about peak oil. The Chinese also, they're, do, they're pushing EVs for security of supply um, issues. They, they don't have as much oil production as we have here. Um, so if you think about an EV in China, from a carbon perspective, it actually produces more carbon than a regular car because they generate the electricity um, using a lot of coal. So it's not, a, it's not a green policy in China, it's a security of supply policy, and if the oil price is low, you don't have to worry about that. Oh, the details. Yeah, <laughs> no, fair enough, Cobalt's right? Cobalt's another big uh, detail that you've mentioned here on this next one on slide 35. What's that? Cobalt. Cobalt, yeah. Yeah, well, so cobalt um, is an essential mineral for batteries. It basically prevents the, 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 the uh, engine from overheating and it increases its range. We only have a 42-year uh, life on cobalt right now. If EV sales went to 8 million, and you can see these forecasts, I mean, it's hard to tell from this chart, but they go way, way above 8 million, right? So if you go to- It's a TAM, man. It's gotta go to infinity and beyond. It's right. Like Buzz Lightyear chart. <laughs> right, so, so if you go above 8 million, you have less than a 20-year life on cobalt, you're gonna have an issue um, and uh, uh, think about what that's gonna do to your handheld devices. The only way to find more cobalt that I can see is um, deep sea mining. Hmm. Um, and uh, um, if you wanna have deep sea mining, if you wanna have this energy transition, you need to have a very oil, high oil price to incent the people to start to do this, mm -hmm. right? So it's not gonna happen with the low oil price. Mm -hmm. And then I love this bullet point, 71% of cobalt currently is produced from the DRC. I mean, I don't think many people know that. Yeah, it's, that's a little that's a little uh, frightening, right? I mean, <laughs> like, you know, talk about security of supply. I mean, I mean, uh, so I'm surprised the Chinese haven't bought the DRC, or maybe they're well. You know, actually, in motion on you, you say that tongue in cheek, <laughs> but I mean, that they they, ha ha they do have uh, um, huge uh, rights to the supply there. So, um, so you can see why I think it is that we're going to go from the age of abundance to uh, an a, a return of scarcity, the return of scarcity driven by conventional oil coming down, driven by tight oil slowing down, that leading to the Goldman thesis of no non-OPAC production growth. And then on the peak demand, I don't think we can, we need to transition to something different, but I don't think we can do it with a low oil price. I think we need to do it with a high oil price. And you can see that coming, coming apart with, you know, EV sales now, you know, negative year mm -hmm. over year, right? So that's what brings us to the, back to the, the, you know, the regime of scarcity. But so now it's down to like timing the inflection point and when is that gonna happen? And I think it's in the next six months. Now the, the biggest issue has been, we've had this demand problem um, this year. The demand problem has come from the trade war. I, I actually have a slide on that that I think is quite interesting if you skip you know, two pages ahead. Yep. I mean, think about this. World trade. Slide 39. Yeah, yep. wor world trade last year was the fourth lowest since 1980. Mm -hmm. That compares to world GDP, which was the 11th lowest. Mm -hmm. So, we, we, like, so the, what happened was really focused on trade, which is an oil issue, right? So, so you know, this is one of the reasons why you know, a lot of the stock market's been working, but it's been very, very bad for oil. If we do get a trade deal, then I think that you know, uh, this is, will remove one of the largest concerns uh, for the oil stocks. But you don't need that to happen to you, change your, to your, the, to, to you're your absolutely inflation. right. Yeah. yeah, we're we're down to like months now thinking about when is this transition going to happen. Yeah. The, the 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 other thing that I think is going to drive the transition, if you skip actually forward to page 42, is I think we're about to have this massive write down. Um, in estimates uh, or change in forecast for tight oil growth. So if you look at the EIA's tight oil growth, I actually, when I wrote this down here for the slide presentation, I had to ask you know, my analysts to check my math, I had to ask my friends to look at this, because I, I, their number makes no sense to me. <laughs> it, 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 it is so high that, you know, I had one person say, oh, that's a political number. I, I mean, so Which one, which number? It, well, in particular, the 1.3 million sequential growth from Q, Q3 to Q4, okay? So to put 1.3 million in context, that's more oil than what all of Libya does. 
<laughs> okay, so they're, they're saying that we're going to add more oil than all of Libya in the next three months, okay? Yeah. And they're saying that despite, go back one page, here's the frack spread count. It is down 40% from peak. Yeah. It is down 25% since July. So it's down 25% as we're supposed to add a Libya. Hmm. So, yeah, how can you make any sense of that? Well, so the way they would make sense of that is they would say, well, there's these new pipelines that are coming on the Permian and that's gonna like open up supply. But to me, that makes no, no sense because if you want more oil, you gotta frack the well. Mm -hmm. And if the frack spreads are down, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you're not going to see it, right? So people don't drill wells and, 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 and leave them sitting in the ground. And drill wells, complete wells, and leave them sitting in the ground. So I, I, feel like, I feel like we're about to have a really big downgrade in um, production growth estimates. And I would say that the commodity market already pretty much believes this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure about the equity market, but I think this, this is one of the, the major things that's going to move us to you know, the, the new regime. Well, the equity market and asset allocators, that's a critical pivot, like a consensus pivot. Uh, I'll often use that when you know, the, the street is way offside on GDP, inflation, or earnings, the three big, you know, the three big things when, when we're thinking about macro rate of change. And when you have a variant um, view that the street almost indefinitely has to you know, come towards, that has to change perception and change how people think about asset allocation, sector allocation, et cetera. And this is, you know, to be clear, that this is a sector that people have shot for dead, and I mean for good. Um, so that's a big, I think that in officialdom, yeah. uh, that's got to be a big catalyst in terms of how people think about it. So, so I also want to explain, we talked about the conventional projects, the end of the conventional projects. So we're having two large ones come on right now. I mean, uh, one in, in Norway, Johan Severdrop, that started in October, that's already ramped in Brazil as well. So you have, you have like the last, big ones. you have the last little surge, mm -hmm. you know, and that's already beginning to be absorbed by the market. So we're down at like time in the next six months, but you get through the six months, you have the downgrading growth, you have the last little gasp from, you know, the conventional projects. Then you look forward, mm -hmm. and look, looking forward is an entirely different world. Wow. And, and, you know, think about the opportunity on page 43 here. This is a chart of the XOP, okay? You know, EMP stocks, basically. <laughs> it, it is below the great financial crisis low. It is below 2016 when oil was 27, okay? Since the beginning of 2016, Brent's up 71% and the XOP is down 31%. I mean, this is the largest underperformance in history. And if you think about the XOP, these are companies. These companies have fixed cost leverage. Their values have gone up more than what oil has gone up, but you wouldn't see that here. So how can you explain something that is seemingly so crazy? And I think this goes back to the Soros reflexivity. Low oil prices, or low equity prices, turn off growth. Mm -hmm. And so the equity market is saying, do not, grow again and produce free cash. You know, page 44, some valuation metrics. This is just from my portfolio. You know, at $55 oil, you know, <laughs> trading around three times EBITDA. I mean, that, that, that used to be seven to nine times, right? On a PV10 basis, uh, which is the value of the proved reserves discounted at 10% uh, rate. I mean, companies used to trade at 2x that. They're trading like half that right now. I mean, so if the market, and if I'm right, the market's going to transition from the age of abundance to this you know, period of scarcity, you're gonna need substantial multiple expansion to turn back on production. And even when that happens, you're not gonna get the production growth you want because they're not gonna be all focused on growing, they're gonna be focused on growing plus free cash flow, and it might be two thirds free cash flow, one third growth. So we could go from what is the worst situation imaginable to like the best, and it could happen in the next Six, six months. Six months, right. I so, like that. So I, I conclude here um, with energy transition because this is what has to happen. We need to move beyond oil. But the question is going to be, is the government going to drive that or is price going to drive that? Mm -hmm. And some people like to quote uh, the, the previous OPEC minister, Sheikh Imani, who would say that the, um, the Stone Age ended um, for, for not a lack of stones, or I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing, right? But I actually feel like that's a nice quip, but it's, it's not relevant. You, you, you think about the way we have energy transition, you know, timber to coal, 
I mean, that happened in England, right? And all around London, you used up all the trees. Out of desperation, you started to produce coal. I mean, that happened with high timber prices. You know, whale oil to rock oil. It might seem like, you know, crazy. I'm talking about whale oil, Moby Dick and all, right? But, <laughs> but, but I mean, basically, we used whale oil to, you know, as a lighter f a fluid. And you, basically, you, you, you fished all the whales, or many of them. And, you, like, out of desperation, we, we tried, you know, petroleum. I mean, that was what it was originally used for. So that, those are examples of the market driving the energy transition. If the government drives the energy transition, you're going to have bottlenecks. You're going to have shortages. I think that what's happening, right, is all the majors today are saying, oh my god, peak demand. Peak demand's coming. It's coming in 10 years. I'm not going to invest. And I'm not going to invest because if I want to go put money in Brazil, which they just all decided not to, I mean, if I were to put money in Brazil, what would happen is I would spend seven years bringing that project on, and then that project would produce for 25 years, and like I'd be an idiot to spend money on that because we got peak demand. So what's happening is because this is being driven by the government, the majors are not investing, and we're going to have a much worse oil price spike than we would at the market drove. Mm. We, the, it would be much, much better if the market had this happen. If the market was, was driving this, you probably wouldn't have the downstate spacing in the Permian. We would, we would get a higher recovery factor from America. We would preserve that oil for the future. That would be better. OPEC wouldn't ramp production all the way up. They'd be more concerned about you know, uh, uh, having a higher price and, and, and having a balanced price. But like we are setting up for a big spike because of the underinvestment. The, the, the lack of um, investment is a bigger hit to supply than the transition to EVs is a hit to demand. Mm. And, and that's the scary thing. And that's, that's what I, I worry about. Because I, I, I think, you know, I mean, sure, it's great for energy stocks. But when you think about society needing to move someplace, we need to get that cobalt out of the bottom of the ocean. And we're not going to do it with Brent at 60, right? So that's a problem. Now, if you turn the page, you can see, you know, we do have low spare capacity, yeah. right? So, you know, this underinvestment's coming. Spare capacity, you know, could easily drop to close to nothing in 2021, 2022. You know, and that's not that far away. I mean, remember, Kenneth the Phase, you know, in 2003 was worried about peak oil. I mean, they were all, they were all worried about this with a five to seven year, you know, lag. And we're like, we're not, we don't have that kind of time to react to this. And we've cut back on investing because we're afraid of the climate, um, which is going to cause more pain to humanity when we get an oil price spike. Now, um, the last page here, this borrows a chart from Bob McNally, who wrote this book called Crude Volatility. And I, I've read many books on oil. This is one of the better ones. But he talks about different pricing regimes. Yeah. And I know you like the volatility regime thing. Um, so if you think about oil, for most of its history, it has been controlled by a cartel, whether that was Rockefeller in the Rockefeller era, or whether that was the Texas Railroad Commission, or whether that was OPEC. And you, know, you sort of want a cartel to control oil, because oil is intrinsically extremely volatile. Mm -hmm. And it's volatile because supply and demand um, are inelastic to price, right? So that's the problem. So if you go to a, a, a period where you do not have a cartel running the, the market, you get massive moves. Yeah. And I, spare capacity goes to zero. You're in a period with no cartel controlling the market. You could get a really, really big um, move upwards in this case, um, at least to begin with. And I think that's a problem. And I think that's what people are, are missing here. Yeah, that's a, that would be a, a big difference. That too would be combined with, if you think of it in just global macro space, if the dollar were to come off a 20-year high, the trade-weighted U.S. dollar, I mean, it has a central tendency, particularly if you're in the what we call the economic quad that we're in, growth yeah. slowing, inflation rising, the Fed being forced to go more dovish, reflate asset prices. What happens is that the dollar picks up you know, that, that inverse correlation with, with commodities broadly, but oil specifically. And that people will come back to that. And most importantly, if they don't, the machine will anyway and force them to come back to it. Because it's actually the machine that picks up on that. So you know, the machine is as prevalent as it's ever been. And it's, it's certainly, I, I think, 
like when I overlay everything that you've said with the with the dollar and the vol picture, right? Because oil volatility or the vol of vol in, right. in OVX or oil volatility index right. just broke. I mean, it broke right on time with your view. That's why, like, we're talking. It's yeah. it's like when you yeah. have two things. Because I wouldn't have had a bullish view on oil if we're in economic quad four, disinflation, deflation, whatever you want. And you've already shown all the different outputs of that. What happened? People blame the trade war, et cetera. But this volatility picture and the potential uh, opportunity for the dollar to actually go down instead of go up, well, I think that's massive. I've, I've heard you talk about shorting. And I think what you say about shorting is that you know it's great to have a company specific you know reason to short but you yeah. want to have a macro overlay yeah. and here we got a macro overlay plus an oil macro overlay <laughs> plus the stocks at all time yeah. lows i mean this is really sort of an amazing uh, setup. I mean, skepticism is just... Well, the behavioral depression. I yeah. mean, uh, guys, you can show slide, uh, I think it's slide 93 in our macro deck that shows just what energy is. You were talking XOP, which is you know, the higher beta component of it, yeah. which I think is, even I won't buy that yet, but after this discussion, I think I, w I might. Yeah. Um, but I'm talking about more, you know, we're talking about Conoco, Exxon, Chevron. 4% um, of the index. I mean, that's four. It, used, it wasn't long ago when we went back to when right. people were concerned about what it, what, mostly what you said in the prior phase or the prior regime that was double digits. Right. You know? Right. So um, it's, you know, also I sh I'm showing that against something that has rising CapEx, which is software. In this case, you know, you, you'd say, what, what would you say that U.S. CapEx, publicly stated CapEx is for, for oil and gas down what? Well, so I, I have a slide on that, actually. Is it? It, well, so, so the slide on that... Let me just find it for you. Is it you. the one that we it's, skipped? It's, it's page, it's, it's page uh, 26. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so, you mean, that is the point. In any other industry, a cyclical investor would be interested because CapEx, well, actually, yeah, you said the worst since 19, it's the worst since 1986. No, it's, it's the worst ever. Combined, right? Yeah, yeah. If you combine the three years there. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, there's no such thing as a Wall Street yeah. that sees something with the worst CapEx cut ever yeah. that trades at three times cash flow. Yeah. I mean, I, I challenge anybody to show me that over a protracted period of time that, it, that doesn't get a new class of investors. Like me, I'm not a, I can, I'll go anywhere. I'm, I'm long cocoa for God's sakes. I'm long timber. Like why would I not buy an equity that trades at three times EBITDA with this kind of an outlook? It's, well, it's, hard, it's hard to say no. Well, so, I mean, you're a better person to address this than me, but it seems to me that we're, we're kind of moving from growth stocks to cyclical stocks. Yes. And if we're moving to cyclical stocks, this is, these are the most cyclical stocks, right? <laughs> yeah, these and, are the most. And, and, and they're the most cyclical stocks that are the most beat up. Yeah. And, and, and have kind of a pretty amazing story. If, if, if back in 2003, people were thinking peak oil is in 2010, I mean, we've blown through 360 billion barrels of oil since then. You know, tight oil saved us, but now that's slowing down and we haven't spent any money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not good, um, situation from the you know, global economic perspective, if you can just look at a couple of years. I mean, I suppose you know, it's nice that we are going to have an energy transition, but we're going to have a much more difficult one because the, we, the oil price was allowed to fall and it didn't come back up fast enough. So it's probably going to overshoot on the upside. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a problem. And you know, uh, an another problem has been, you know, we've got this incessant tweeting about, you know, we need to have low oil prices. And I just think it's good to remember that it's, it, this is happening probably at the best time for America because we are now not a net importer. If this had happened, you know, with us importing yeah. 8 million barrels a day, it would be much, much worse. For China, this is a real problem. You know, mm. for Korea, this is a problem. For Japan, a problem. For Europe, a problem. I mean, for America, not so bad. Mm -hmm. For Russia, this is great, mm -hmm. right? So, like, political power is going to change because of... Uh, it this, always uh, has. Yeah. You know, and that's, it's not a cycle thing. That's a generational thing. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it, it's great that you took us back and you zoomed back in. Because I think that most people, like, when they look at something from a macro perspective, they're really just not looking at it on a multi-duration and certainly not a multi-factor basis. And that's what... You did a great job of that. And I, I also think that or at least this is like one of my last questions because we have to wrap up, but the, if, 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 you're, if this isn't right, if people don't buy, uh, the commodity is one thing, but if people don't actually have to buy energy stocks, 
with the fundamentals changing, yeah. which would surprise me. By yeah. the way, they've already been buying them. Yeah. We've been doing great on it. I mean, yeah. since October, uh, the beginning of October. Yeah. So, so now their their moving averages look better. Yeah. But I mean, if they don't buy them for real, yeah. Why wouldn't the majors buy all the best assets for real? Well, so first off, if they don't buy them for real and the oil price goes up, like yeah. we just got, the companies are going to buy themselves. That's what I mean. Like they're, they're going to buy. They're like they're going to share buybacks. Are going to ramp up. I mean, then you're, if they don't move from here, then you're you're ostensibly you're. Your 2021 EVD, but the multiples will be two, or, or I mean, if, right? Or, or if you know, if oil price goes to, I mean, we stopped at 75 there. If it goes to 90, yeah. I, mean, I mean, like, so what should you do if you're a CEO in this industry? Mm -hmm. I mean, you should buy back your shares. Yeah. Don't drill. Yeah. I mean, like, get the message, right? Mm -hmm. Don't drill. Save your oil for later. <laughs> No, because it's going yeah. to be much, much better yeah. Yeah. later. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, some of the companies in some of the basins, you know, the Bakken and the Eagleford, are not, they don't have the ability to grow all that yeah. much anymore because we've already blown through it. The Permian companies in aggregate, I think, can double one more time, but like, don't grow 25%, mm -hmm. grow 12 Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, we did, um, I mean, our energy team did a, Basically, a quality screen. I mean, we're not not known for finding frauds, for example, in the MLP space or low quality assets with negative free cash flow. So, I'm like, guys, like, just show us the you know how you run anything else, the highest quality free cash flowing assets, and and it's it was amazing that Anadarko showed up right at the top of their list, right before, you know, the the battle for Anadarko began, and that started without being in this six month window. Yeah, I can all, I can't even imagine what the bidding would have been like if if this plays out and it already is playing out in the next six months for an asset like that. And moreover, you mentioned in a name like Parsley sc screens well on the same metrics. Right. The Canadian companies screen very well. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. Well, this is going to be a massive positive for Canada. I mean, I know yeah. you like Canada yeah. and, and, you know, I think that they're going to get their pipeline eventually because if this happens, like, you know, we, we got to get that. Well, like pipeline. I said, I mean, like our favorite Canadian, uh, Canadian natural resources, I mean, yeah. it's, it's just already free cash flowing like right. bananas. Right. So, I mean, it's not, right. like, that's not a debate. Right. Um, well, so, I mean, I mean, in general, the industry is free cash flow break even around 50. But, I mean, we, this year, I mean, I, I, I showed how, you know, the, um, the frac spread count had fallen in, the, in these production profiles, you know, growth estimates were really high. But if you actually look at what we've done year to date, mm -hmm. and you, you got to look December to like the last monthly data came in, in in August, right? You can't look year over year. If you look year over year, it looks like we grew a lot, yeah. right? Because what happened is we grew a lot last year. We grew a lot last year right in front of the, the potential Trump sanctions on Iran. And so everyone thought he was going to sanction Iran in November. He gave us waivers, and everyone grew into that. And the private equity guys were like looking for their exit window, mm -hmm. and it just didn't happen. They grew too much, and it created a, a huge problem. But now, if you look sequentially from December to August, like it's, I have the exact number in here, but it's like 280,000 barrels a day, what we grind. It's like, it's like nothing. The number the year before was a million more than the yep. number th this year. Hmm. So, so, so um, you know, uh, the, the slowdown is, is upon us. It's just a question of when the market chooses to recognize it. I think, you know, you're right, we don't need a resolution to the trade war. It'd be nice if we got one. There's no sector that's gotten more hurt from the trade war than this sector. So if you believe the trade war is going to get resolved, this sector is absolutely the, the place to get bullish. But we don't need that. We just need a little bit more time to pass and that pricing regime to change. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to say, I mean, just in conclusion, all I needed was Quad 3 to buy energy. I mean, now yeah. that you gave me this, yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, obviously we, we, we have some fundamental views. I mean, I, in addition to all, everything that you said, yeah. our team in Washington is expecting OPEC to cut in the new year. Well, that's and, a very and, contrarian perspective. Yeah, yeah but, but so that's, it, that's part of like yeah. our research view. So yeah. is um, Aramco trying to come public and MBS having his intention. So there's, there's a lot, there, there, there's so many different, like I think of them, um, a long idea. I'm an Irish Catholic Canadian guy, so of course I think about you know the tree. But like when I have a beautifully decorated tree, it's just like I have so many more ornaments. All my kids come in with new stuff. It's like this thesis. Like I said, I'd buy it anyway with Quad Three because yeah. it's one of the top 
subsector allocations. Yeah. The problem is we haven't had any any real economic quad three yeah. for people to buy into. Yeah. Um, and this fully loaded, I mean, it's 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 as compelling as anything that I that I could find. So yeah. so thank you for. Um, not only opening your process up, but just like taking the time to do such great work. I mean, I don't, I don't think uh, anybody that's watching this has seen this kind of a presentation, and, yeah. it, and I think it was your first, you know, drill down. So thanks. Yeah, for, this is for my doing first uh, public presentation like yeah. this. I mean, I've done it to individuals, but I appreciate you allowing me the opportunity to come in and share my views. Yeah, you crushed it, man. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Hopefully, much. it goes as well as uh, he and uh, both I think think it's going to go. He's Mark Gordon. I'm Keith McCullough, uh, and thanks for joining us. Thank you.